Um, tonight, Adam's going to turn his attention to something that uh, I, I guess he's maybe still developing some of his ideas on, uh, a rather troubling area, if you like. So tonight, he's going to talk to us about eugenics, its dark history, and its troubling past. So over to you, Adam, and you could share your screen, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you, Pat. That's a very uh, generous in introduction. Um, and that's Lushkin, my cat, who has, this is the main access route into the house. So I, if, if she walks across, I'm, I apologize in advance. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen because I've got slides. Um, and hold on just a sec. Um, so you should be seeing my slides now, is that right? You should be seeing my three book covers? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So uh, yeah. So um, uh, as you as you very accurately described, the the, the 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 this is work that I've been thinking about for twenty five years, really, because I was an undergraduate at UCL, and and one of my books from from a few years ago was called A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived, and in that. I began to develop some of the ideas between about the relationship between the history of genetics, my field, and um, the construction of race and racism, but also separately the intertwining of the history of genetics with with um, the ideology of eugenics. Now, one of the reasons why eugenics is is part of my sort of overall purview is because much of it was developed at UCL. So for the last since I was since I was nineteen when I was an undergraduate in in the um, genetics department, the Galton Laboratory, as it was then, uh, Francis Galton and the concept of eugenics has been a big part of my of my sort of intellectual development. And in my later years, in the last few years, as I've been writing about the interface between history and and biology, well, science more broadly, but specifically genetics and evolutionary biology, these two subjects have become the focus of my last two books. So, How to Argue the Racist came out in 2020, and my next book, which is out in February. Uh, February the 3rd is called Control, it's the title of this talk, and it is about the history of eugenics, but also its repercussions and its legacy in, in our present practices and, and in society today. Now, as a housekeeping note, um, I, I, the reason I do talks like this is because I want to test the ideas. I want to test what lands with audiences. I want to see what they're interested in, because that's not always the same as what you're interested in as a writer. And you are my guinea pigs. So I, I've been teaching this to undergraduates and to various sort of academic or close to academic audiences for many years now. But because this book is coming out in February, um, this this is going to be part of my, my sort of uh, public output, talking about the history of eugenics and talking about this particular book. But this talk is the very first time I'm doing this. So I'm asking you for some some leeway and offering up a preemptive apology because I haven't timed it. Um, I'm notoriously bad at timekeeping. It may be 20 minutes long or three hours long. I'm hoping that it's going to be somewhere in, in the middle of that. Um, and also it is because it's the first time the structure is going to be, I think there's a structure there, but I will be changing it as I as I continue to do this talk. So so if I could uh, if I could beg your forgiveness, if this feels like it's the first time out, because it is actually the first time out for, for this talk. OK, so that's that's the sort of setup for this idea. Um, one, one of the reasons that we're talking about this now is because well, what I argue in the book is that understanding the history of our field is really important because the legacies um, uh, persist in, in our current work within genetics and within society more broadly. But as conversations about the relationship between politics and, um, and science, and particularly genetics and evolutionary biology, are becoming more, more prevalent in the, in the popular discourse, a few things have happened in the last few years which have really sort of acted as a tipping point for why I think this needs to be a public conversation that happens um, robustly now. One of those things is that these three gentlemen, many of you, many of who of, of you will know who they are, will know their work in great detail. Many of you will use their work in statistics and evolutionary biology, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Carl Pearson on the left there, um, there's Francis Galton with a hat on, and then Ronald Fisher with the with the bushy beard. And of course, these are three of the founding figures in well, all biological sciences, in all of statistics, in psychology. Uh, the, they're three titans of, of science. Our in, entire fields are based on 
uh, rest on the shoulders of, of th these three men and a few others. Um, they're all very closely associated with, with UCL. Francis Galton was never actually at UCL, but he bequeathed a scholarship, uh, sorry, a professorship and a lot of money to UCL to set up the Galton Laboratory where I was an undergraduate. And Carl Pearson was the first um, Galton professor and Ronald Fisher was the second Galton professor. So their scientific legacies are unmatched three absolute titans of um, late 19th and early 20th century science, whose work we simply cannot abandon, whose work we absolutely re rely on. Um, they also were three key founding members of the whole eugenics movements. I'll talk about Galton specifically in, in just a minute. And as a result of the sort of rediscovery of that outside of the academic world of genetics and, and outside of the, the, the biology department of UCL in the last few years, and in the culture that we currently occupy where we are reassessing the political views of uh, significant historical characters, um, in the last two or three years, all three of these men have, have had their, their um, legacies reassessed. Um, in 2018, UCL instigated its first eugenics inquiry, which concluded in, in 2020, in February 2020, just a couple of weeks before the first lockdown began. And one of the outcomes of this investigation, of this inquiry, was that the names of Galton, Pearson and Fisher were to be removed and have now been removed from um, UCL's buildings and namings. So the Galton Lecture Theatre is now Theatre 115, the Pearson Building is now the Northwest Wing, the Galton Professorship has been permanently retired, and the Galton Restitution Fund, the money that he left, has been redistributed to employ uh, three excellence fellows, which are, which are being advertised at the moment, um, for um, younger researchers willing, uh, at, the, at the point where they're setting up their, their careers. So this is very much part of the sort of public discourse on assessing historical figures, but also trying to understand the, um, the relationship between the history of our field and our current practices. And I argue, and my work is based around um, arguing that our history is interesting, not just because it's interesting and it's recent and history is interesting, but also because it informs our current practices. So in, in this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on that history, on the relationship between the sort of late 19th um, centuries and development of the ideas of eugenics. And I'm going to take it up to the end of, well, its, its ultimate um, ramifications in the Second World War and the Holocaust. And then briefly at the end, touch on why we're still thinking about some of these ideas with contemporary um, medical and reproductive interventions and new technologies, so new, new, new genetic technologies that are part of, are becoming part of, of the tools of, of of, of genetics and human genetics today. So that's that's broadly the setup. So Francis Galton, I'm sure you, many of you will know ex exactly who he is. His, his leg legacy is absolutely uh, enormous, but he is the guy who formulates the idea of eugenics and spends most of, much of the rest of his, uh, the, the second half of his life as a sort of proto scientist, a sort of gentleman scientist, um, developing ideas about population control via this new idea, this new ideology, a political ideology of, of eugenics. This is one of the definitions that he comes up with during his life. This one's from 1907, written with um, Carl Pearson, uh, which you can read for yourself, but the, it, it, the whole idea about um, uh, eugenics, it is, it is that it is the application of the new understanding of biology that came a few years after uh, Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859, um, as applied to humans, to human societies, with, uh, the, with the sense that as humans are now demonstrably understood to be animals and evolved, that we can apply the same selective pressures, artificial selection that Darwin talks about in the first chapter of The Origin of Species, um, we can apply that to humans as a means of improving the quality or the stock of, of, of a people. Now, I'm going to be using a lot of language which is uh, some, somewhat archaic, and uh, some of it sounds offensive to our ears today, but so I apologise in advance for that. I'll be contextualising those some of these terms, even though they sound weird to us. So things like, you know, talking about the stock of a population is a very Victorian or Edwardian term and not really one that we would use today to describe populations. But the key idea here, at least in the first half of this talk, is that 
the concept of improving the stock of a population via this eugenics methods that understands that we as biological organisms are, are mutable and not immutable, as had been thought in, in earlier generations. The concept of improving a population is much older than eugenics. And in fact, I think it's pretty much eternal throughout human cultures, throughout all human cultures. And, and that's one of the things I, I explore at the beginning of the book in, in depth. I'll just skip through some of some of the examples of this, because the first version of of what you could broadly describe as as um, eugenics in the Western canon is described in books five and six of of Republic by Plato, in which he describes how populations, as a, he has a concern that uh, people are not breeding enough um, and that people of high quality are not breeding enough. And this becomes a persistent theme from the third century BC into the present day. And that the, 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 the people of high quality are not breeding enough, but people of lower quality are breeding too much and are therefore in danger of swamping the high quality system. So he came up with a, a metricized, a quantification system in which he describes uh, gold caliber men and women should be paired together and bronze caliber men and women should be paired together and their children should be bred um, as a means of maintaining strata in society where the improvement was part of the, uh, the, the overall mission of a sort of philosopher king. So that's right there in Republic. That, that really is a sort of proto-eugenics idea. It's never enacted, of course. It, it remains theory throughout his life. Um, uh, and uh, another example comes from the, the, well, the legend of Sparta more than the, the historical fact of Sparta more than anything. There's only really one description of the infanticide and birth control and population control descriptions that we attribute to the Spartans. And that comes from Plutarch several hundred years later. But this idea that this great militaristic might, this, this, this you know, incredibly powerful uh, nation state of Sparta, um, one of the reasons it had such militaristic might was it's, it brought uh, young boys into the military at the age of seven, but only after they passed the first hurdle of selection, which was at birth, where um, anyone, anyone deformed or deemed uh, defective in any way, or the, one, uh, the children that couldn't survive exposure overnight were cast off Mount Tegatos into um, the, the uh, apotheke, which is a, a deposit, a pit. And this, this image here is from the not historical film um, 300, but it does show uh, the axe. Those are fetal skulls or baby skulls down at the bottom. There isn't any physical evidence for um, infanticide in, in Sparta in, in the deposits. There are bones of adults, but we, we just don't know. So it may, may be mythical, but it becomes a persistent theme. The reference to Spartans um, re remains a persistent theme throughout the history of eugenics right up into, into the 20th century. We don't really know whether it happened or not. But what we do know is that Rome practiced, um, uh, actively practiced um, uh, infanticide, uh, in, infanticide by selecting, Seneca describes in, in the first century how we kill rampant bulls, we kill diseased chickens, and we drown babies if they, if they look deformed. And we think this is a verifiable example of infanticide that happens in Rome. In, in the UK in 1921, in Hambledon, um, 91 bodies were discovered in a, in a Roman dig of babies. Um, and some historians have argued that this is an example of some sort of form, formularized um, um, infanticide policy, which may be selective. It may, it may conversely reflect different burial practices or different death rituals in that adults would have been cremated and babies would have been interred. But nevertheless, this, this is part of the sort of suite of evidence that isn't just in Western civilizations and classical Roman Greece, but all over the world in pretty much every culture, infanticide as a means of population control and issuing control over the reproductive autonomy of people, but primarily of women, is something which effectively appears to be pretty much universal in, in almost all cultures. So this idea that population control is, is, is ancient and it, it it, it is for, I'm going to skip forward a couple of thousand years now, and of course you'll you'll be familiar with the works of of Malthus, where in the late 18th, early 19th century, it becomes more formalised, and Malthus describes the inherent problem in that 
happy populations grow exponentially, but resources grow um, in a linear fashion. So all populations are, are doomed to this sort of cycle of, of population growth until the resources can't meet them. And this was a sort of metric of success of, of, uh, of, of populations. You know, as an economist, he, he's about as good as any economist in predicting things that may or may not happen, sort of flip of a coin type thing. That was like, there's probably economists in the audience, so I apologise to them for that. But this is the sort of general context in which in the 19th century, um, people are beginning to fret in a sort of pseudoscientific but a more academically formalised way about population control. And so on this slide, I'm trying to summarise some of the ideas of what the, the sort of landscape, the, the, the soil in which the idea of eugenics, this sort of pseudoscientific version of population control is planted and then can emerge. So as a result of industrialization and urbanization, we have expanding cities, we have expanding populations, we have a much more visible poor. You've got the poor laws that were established in Tudor times being repeated and replaced with um, various acts of parliament, including the lunacy laws and the madhouse laws, and a general trend towards the state taking a, a more active, more proactive role in the institutionalization, in the, in the care, although that's a pretty euphemistic term, of people who are deemed, who are at the bottom end of, of society. We've also got mass immigration coming in from, from the expanding colonies, um, that's that's a that's more of an issue in, in America, and I'll probably allude to that uh, uh, later on. Um, but we've also got you know an endless conflict in the colonies as well. In the late nineteenth century, in the, in the eighteen nineties, the Boer War is raging, and and the the, the British get their um, um, get their asses kicked. And that this this is another fuel for suggesting for various higher you know, members of, of hegemonic power in, in the UK to suggest that we're not physically capable of dealing with these um, um, uh, people from the colonies who are fitter and healthier than us. And then alongside that, you've got the emerging and the, the, the cementing of scientific racism, which really sort of starts in the 17th century, but in the 19th century is, is becoming more and more robust. And that goes very much hand in hand with concepts of white supremacy in, uh, in, a, in a literal sense in that um, colonial expansion and, and expansion particularly of Western European powers around the world is almost, high, almost always hierarchically really based uh, with with white Europeans being at the top of that top of that pile and then there's this emerging uh, well, possibly eternal but certainly again being formalized in the sort of um, the, 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 the scholarly and um, uh, chattering classes of Victorian Britain this idea about declinism that everything is in the past is was better particularly in ancient Greece and Rome and everything is getting worse today um, and uh, alongside that uh, another eternal threat, which is um, that populations are being replaced by invaders, by underclass. And again, in the UK, in Britain, it's slightly different from the same idea being expressed in America. And I'll, I'll come to that. So there's this sort of rich soil in which this idea it, 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 um, can, be, um, can be planted. And so Galton comes along and he's Charles Darwin's uh, half cousin, and he comes along uh, already established, having traveled extensively as, uh, as a young man around um, Africa and hating the whole experience. Um, and um, he's absolutely enamored with the work of, of his cousin and begins to formulate this idea, which is um, the, the, the application of evolutionary theory um, to humans as a means of, of bettering the British society. Um, a, a bit of biography very quickly. So there's a little bit of the family tree. They're, they're half cousins in that they share a grandfather. There's, can I point? Can you see my cursor? Yeah, you can. So there's, there's Charles Darwin there and there's Francis Galton there. And they know each other and they talk to each other and they communicate with each other. And Galton is very enamored with, with Darwin's work and sends great praise to him on multiple occasions. Um, I, let me briefly, as a sort of cul-de-sac, talk about some of Galton's astonishing intellect and astonishing legacy, intellectual legacy, because he's part of inventing a whole set of things on which society is very dependent to this day. There's a couple of trivial examples here. Galton is the first person to invent or use a weather map, and this is, is that weather map published in the Times in 1875. It is actually the day after, like this is the weather of the day before. So 
you know, arguably of limited use. Nevertheless, every time you see a weather map on TV or in the paper, Dalton was the first person to, to do that. Uh, bottom right there, um, Dalton's interest in both measuring things and concepts about heredity, which becomes a sort of dominant passion of, of his life via eugenics. Uh, one of the questions that he was fundamentally interested in was what, how are characteristics passed from parent to child? And in the, in the mid 19th century, the idea that fingerprints were either heritable or not was not really well studied. Um, Galton was interested in that question and helped develop the idea and test the idea that indeed fingerprints are unique to individuals. And although there is some heritability in terms of the patterns, basically they are, they are unique for individuals. As a result of that, the development of fingerprints as a forensic techniques emerges. And of course the police um, and criminologists re still rely on the development of fingerprints under Galton's aus auspices to this very day. The top right is a bit of a joke. This is published in 1906 in the journal Nature, uh, which was Galton's um, new way of cutting a round cake um, on the grounds that if you cut a cake in um, like, you know, crossways as you would normally cut a cake, that it's uh, liable to dry out. Whereas if you cut it in this particular way shown on the diagram there, you can sandwich back the quarters and it won't dry out. Didn't really catch on. Anyway, he also comes up with the term nature versus nurture, which as, or as Pat will say, and all evolutionary biologists and geneticists will say has blighted the field for the last 140 years or so, but the, the idea that nature is innate in us, what is inbuilt in us and what we now regard as genetic and what is nurture, which is in the environment, but more broadly today, we, ref we think of the, the, the non-genetic environment, meaning everything in the universe that isn't DNA. But the idea that these two things uh, are in conflict with each other, nature versus nurture, comes from Galton. He invents that term. It, it's not It's not correct. We, we don't think of them these two things, the innate genetic and the environmental, as being in conflict with each other today. They work in concert with each other. But nevertheless, this idea is very much part of his thinking. And as the first hereditarian, the first person to really think that the innate is much more important than the environmental, his weight is definitely on nature rather than nurture. And that is what his motivation is for studying large parts of heredity and inventing lots of techniques to understand heredity. Um, and, um, and, and on top of that, build a model where greatness of people or the qualities of people can be enhanced via this, this idea of eugenics. So there again is, is that definition from a bit later, from 1907. And again, a racial term, uh, sorry, a, a word, semantic terminology thing here. Some of the words we use today are, don't, aren't used in the same way that they were in the 19th century. And when he's talking about race there, it doesn't necessarily mean the same as how we describe the social construction of race as we do today. You know, Darwin talks about races of cabbage and races of pigeons. Um, but broadly, you know, we're talking about type or population or, or groups of, of people. There isn't really a, a, um, an equivalent term. This is a sort of model of how Dalton imagined society could be like and should be like uh, if eugenics is practiced in the way that he was suggesting, that you have a, a large, respectable working class and you have a small hegemonic power at the top and we reduce the amount of criminals and paupers and undesirables via selective breeding. Um, herein lies some of the fundamental problems with eugenics because although it starts off as a sort of positive idea to improve society it absolutely and quintessentially relies on a hierarchy of people um, if you have people at the top whose characteristics you wish to enhance that inherently means there are people whose characteristics you wish to to suppress and so what you see with eugenics and part of the argument of the book and one of the ideas I want to sort of develop is where that ranking comes from. What, what is the power structure which allows some people to be on top of others? And of course, the Victorian age is, is different. They have different um, social and cultural norms. But in all cases where eugenics is explored, the initial groups of people who are deemed desirable or undesirable, very rapidly expand to include um, less precise diagnoses and less precise categorizations until you see the ultimate realization of this and it's just people we don't really like. So eugenics becomes, in every practical sense, it becomes 
um, a sort of a, a centerizing, a, 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 an idea that is exclusion, exclusory apart from the people that, of the group that you're in. And so it's always expressed by the powerful to the less powerful. So it includes racialized groups. It includes people with disabilities. It includes people with pseudo medical, pseudo medical or pseudo psychiatric diagnoses, as well as more well established physiological um, medical diagnoses, such as Huntington's or what was then referred to as Mongolism, but what we would now refer to as people with Down syndrome. And then it expands to include poor, poor people, working class people, and then non-specific mental health diagnoses, which include archaic terms such as feeble mindedness or imbeciles, low grade imbeciles, idiots and morons. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, in just a bit. And then it expands to include iterant alcoholics, iterant criminals, people with epilepsy, women with menstrual troubles, and so on. So the discussion about eugenics that, hap that is happening primarily in the UK, but expands to other countries, and I'll talk about Germany, I'll talk about America in more detail in a minute, includes like who are the undesirables? Who are the people that we need to be um, removing some, from society or removing the franchise from, or more specifically with regards to eugenics, removing, uh, rendering, rendering them sterilized. So removing reproductive autonomy from these people. And all in all cases, the, um, the criteria are vague and non-specific and a bit um, nebulous. One of the things that I think we find very difficult to process only a hundred years after this is really a central part of the public discourse is quite how popular this was as an idea. The ideas of eugenics have become so irredeemably toxic um, most mostly as a result, I think, of the actions of the Nazis. Um, but only, you know, a few decades before that, it is it eugenics has bipartisan and almost universal support, almost universal support. This is an advert from um, from the uh, from the railways. Um, about you know, promoting good breeding and using this agricultural analogy. This is another example. This is a eugenic. Uh, Valentine's card. So, you know, the idea that um, you would uh, woo someone, woo a, a woman um, by declaring quite how uh, eugenically pure and mentally and physically balanced you were. So again, you know, this is, this is part of the public discourse. Um, to exemplify bipartisan support, I've picked four, four people who were very active in promoting ideas of, of eugenics from across the political spectrum. When I do this in front of the students, I ask them to name who these people are, and they very rarely get any of them right, but I know that all of you will know exactly who these are. Top left, that's Beatrice and Sidney Webb, so left-wing activists, founders of the Fabian Society. George Bernard Shaw in the hat, top right. A young Winston Churchill, bottom left, and the former Prime Minister Arthur Balfour in the bottom uh, bottom right, all very active, vocally active, and in some cases, um, uh, politically active in terms of developing legislation and action with regards to eugenics. Um, we're now into the Edwardian era, and one of the things that I think is very interesting about the eugenics movements and shows it's bipartisan and confusing from our modern point of view uh, popularity is that eugenics becomes a, a sort of central pillar of first wave feminism. And so ideas about reproductive autonomy for women, which we now regard as part of the emancipation of women, at the time, the eugenics angle to this was very much associated with removing the reproductive rights of women um, from lower socioeconomic statuses. So Mary Stopes, most commonly associated with the reproductive rights of women in clinics all around the world and offering um, abortion advice and services to hundreds of thousands of women for the last many decades. Well, Stopes was a passionate eugenicist. She was also profoundly racist by any standards of any time, and she absolutely adored Hitler and wrote him love poetry. One of her main motivations for being so interested in reproductive rights or reproductive issues for women was as a eugenicist so that she could um, uh, pursue one of her great interests, which was the removal of the Irish and Slavic people and Jews from London. This is a poem that she wrote, and this is in the 30s, right? So this is not, you know, this is not that early, but she wrote a book of love poetry and sent it to the German chancellor uh, in 33, I think that one is for. So there's some 
proper horror stories from people that today we regard as as as, as having positive legacies. But you know, people are complex, and I'm not I'm not really in the business of you know po post hoc or posthumous cancellation of people. I just as a, as an academic and as someone who is interested in decent scholarship about these these sorts of issues because I think they're important. I think we just have to be absolutely straightforward about the, the fact that people are complex and they have complex legacies. William Beveridge is another example, the architect of the welfare state and um, and of the NHS in many ways, also as a young man uh, affected very strongly eugenics views that, um, so that, that pointed out in this, this particular quotation that, that um, particular men should not only lose the vote and civil freedoms, but also fatherhood. Now, Churchill is a key player in this, and I, I think I'm in the next few months I'm going to get into hot water about this because it's hard to criticize Churchill, one of our greatest leaders and, and the person who is charged with one of his great legacies in vanquishing one of the greatest evils that, that humanity's ever seen. But he was profoundly racist as well. And he was also passionate, a passionate advocate of eugenics policies, at least for a couple of decades. He appears to have lost interest in it by the 1920s, by certainly by the end of the First World War. But Churchill is very instrumental in, in developing policy, particularly um, two bills, one of which didn't pass and one of which did in 1913, the Mental Deficiencies Act. And he drafted early versions and campaigned quite um, vigorously within politics to include specific eugenics um, uh, legislation clauses in these bills. And for example, as it says on the slide, using x-rays, newly discovered x-rays, they're only, what, 16 years old at this point, to sterilize men and women um, who were in the categories that the eugenicists were interested in eradicating from, from society. So that goes into the 1912, published in 1913, or passes, passes Royal Assent in 1913, the Mental Deficiencies Act, which, which lasts from 1913 until um, 1959, I, I think it was, but it doesn't include compulsory sterilization by the state. And the reason it doesn't uh, include that is largely down to G.K. Chesterton, weirdly enough, the, the poet and, and Christian apologist and Orthodox Catholic humorist who um, spent a lifetime campaigning against, against eugenics and successfully lobbied particularly one MP, Josiah Wedgwood, who's part of the Wedgwood Darwin clan, um, who also was passionately opposed to eugenics. And Chesterton's opposition to eugenics is sort of exemplified in, in that bottom quote. He was, he was a humorist and he was very funny about it, but also he felt very passionately something which I think is correct, which is that the eugenics uh, categories weren't targeted at those specific, uh, you know, sort of pseudoscientific or pseudo clinical diagnoses such as feeble mindedness or imbeciles or women with menstrual problems as as decreed they all targeted uh, the poor right and so we, we see we see evidence of sort of malthusian thinking in scrooge um in a christmas carol and in uh, in chesterton's book eugenics and other evils just in case you were unsure of his views on on eugenics he makes he makes that very point he thinks that he, he says very very specifically that you can't breed out poverty using eugenics means because the poor are not a breed. Um, and anyway, he, he successfully lobbies Josiah Wedgwood and Wedgwood has this clause about involuntary sterilization removed from the Mental Deficiencies Act of, of 1913. And that is how close we came in the UK to having official eugenics policies. It was just a, a, whisk, a whisker away. And I think that that's very interesting because this is in, in many ways London, particularly, and a bit of Cambridge and ideas around the UK were really where eugenics was was first developed. It's not not just at UCL, but in the sort of salons and clubs of of London and universities around the country. But we never actually had a policy. Now the same can't be said for something like thirty other countries around around the world. And in the book and in the talk, I'll just sort of touch on two of them because I think they tell slightly different stories and stories that are important for our overall understanding of the repercussions of, of eugenics today. So it's about 30, 31 countries around the world have official eugenics policies during the 20th century, almost all in the form of uh, involuntary sterilization. Um, 
uh, but the UK is, is not one of them. So let's talk about America. This, this is a map from 1913. The first eugenics legislation comes into, into force in Indiana in 1907, but they'd already been talking about eugenics types ideas with uh, mating strategies, so people having to provide, prospective couples having to provide family histories, uh, demonstrating that they weren't suffering from um, uh, heritable problematic conditions and from as early as, as um, the mid 1890s. But in 1907, Indiana adopts the first statewide involuntary sterilization law. And over the next um, several decades, it is 31 states in the US that, that have official eugenics policies. California, interestingly, that famously liberal state being the most vigorous adopter in the first two decades of the 20th century, um, California uh, accounts for half of the involuntary sterilizations carried out in, um, in America. Now, this is a slide that shows the, the sort of, well, on the left-hand side, the normalization of this is a sort of pseudoscientific, pseudo-psychiatric um, technique. This is, a, this is from a textbook about breeding and about eugenics policies from uh, 1912. And it shows the words that they used at the time, which had clinical, um, uh, clinical significance and were clinically significant in the decision to in to in, enforce sterilization on people that fell into these categories on the right hand side is a, dem a demonstration a pro-eugenics demonstration from new york i think it's 1917 uh, the um the resolution on this photo is not very high but it says uh, for example i must drink alcohol to sustain life shall i transfer this craving to others um I can't read the other one because our faces are on the left hand of the screen and I can't see it, but you can probably see it for yourself. So a very similar idea is emerging at the same time. There's a strong influence from the Goltonians at UCL um, and indeed one of the key protagonists in the eugenics movement in America met Galton in 1899. I'll talk about Charles Davenport in just a minute. And he is he's this sort of Galton equivalent in, in the States, but it also is from up on high. So Roosevelt is a keen eugenicist and writes to Charles Davenport. This is after his, his presidency, after, after his term is finished and expresses a, a very clear eugenic idea um, there. And I, I wanna go, for, when, in talking about America, I wanna talk about the bottom one of those earlier, the sort of social context, the soil in which the eugenics idea was, was, was planted. And that is, what's known as replacement theory, the idea that the powerful or the existing population are threatened by either an internal underclass replacing them because they have more babies and the, 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 um, uh, the, the existing uh, people don't have enough, or that there is immigration from external uh, forces. Now, I think that the immigration idea is very significant in America because this is a time when there is mass immigration into into America. And it's also part of the sort of general culture of worry, a persistent threat. And eugenics becomes absolutely tethered to, to this threat. Again, in the UK, it's heavily influenced by this idea that this is what happened in Rome, and particularly the fall of Rome. And there is a particular class of people who are the key protagonists in the eugenics movement, and they include Ronald Fisher, and they include Galton and Pearson, and Churchill and Balfour, that they go through a particular educational structure which goes top public school, they all either went to Eton or Harrow, followed by um, maths and classics at Oxbridge, almost exclusively at Oxbridge. And I think that is significant because I think that there is a veneration for classical civilization that is predicated on them reading Gibbon, the fall of the Roman, decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but not really a super, not, not, nothing more than a sort of superficial reading of Gibbon and really just the assumption that the barbarians at the gates, um, they're coming from the east, they're both immigrating and they have more babies than us and therefore we are constantly under threat. Fisher, Ronald Fisher talks about this explicitly in, in his key textbook, his key scientific textbook, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. Um, the final three chapters are devoted to some pretty potty ideas about eugenics. The first eight chapters are about the fundamentals of population genetics. A very strange book. 
quite important but strange book. But when it comes to this idea about population replacement, this is so universally held and supported in, in society, and particularly in a slightly different way in America. And I'm very interested in the sort of cultural context of, of eugenics. Now, I, I know all of you will have read The Great Gatsby. I, I love it. I've read it several times. Um, and it's one of my favorite books. And I'd never really noticed until about three or four years ago that a big theme in The Great Gatsby is specifically the promotion or the discussion of eugenics and replacement theory. Tom Buchanan, Daisy's horrible husband, on about page four, very explicitly discusses the, the um, Great Replacement Theory as described to him in a book that he read by a fictional scientist called Stoddard. And Stoddard is based on three real scientists called Goddard, Goddard, and Madison Grant. And I'll talk about a couple of them in, in just a minute. So Gatsby, for reasons, I'll, and I'll come on to Gatsby in just a second as well. Gatsby it really has this very, very clear underlying eugenics idea in one of the great books of the 20th century. And I think we don't even notice it. I think many of, I hadn't noticed it in the, 30 years that I've been familiar with that as, as a text. And another example comes from the food that we eat. So John Harvey Kellogg is one of the Kellogg brothers and they effectively invent the way we eat breakfast today for very peculiar reasons. John Harvey Kellogg, he, he became, um, he split up from his brother and they, they sort of together invented the cornflake. The reason they split up was because John Harvey was obsessed with protecting there's no polite way of saying this, protecting the bodily fluids of what upstanding white American young men. He believed in abstinence. He believed in, he, he was married to his wife for, 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 I think, 31 years and boasted about how he had never had sex with her once. He also had, a, he boasted about having a daily enema, um, which I just think is strange. Um, but his, the creation of the cornflake was in service of his idea that spicy foods, sugary foods, in fact, any flavor in any foods, including coffee and tea, were uh, encouraged the libido and therefore should be suppressed. And he, he split from his brother because his brother wanted to add sugar to cornflakes. Anyway, you know, completely nutty story. Next time, you know, tomorrow morning when you're eating breakfast cereal, you can you can reflect on the fact that the reason you're eating cornflakes is because one man in 1894 thought that it might suppress your libido and therefore you wouldn't waste your um, precious bodily fluids. Aside from that, he plugged his enormous amount of wealth into a sanatorium and the creation of what was called the Ray Betterment Foundation, which was one of the two key eugenics establishments in the United States for the first three decades of the 20th century. It was uh, closely associated with Charles Davenport, the key eugenicist in, in the US. And again, part of the cultural normalization of both replacement theory, white supremacy, and, and, and its pseudoscientific ideological um, action class, which is eugenics itself. Now, just to go back to Gatsby briefly, the evidence for Gatsby's association with eugenics is fascinating because it, 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 Gatsby is not based on, or the individual characters in Gatsby are not based on, on individual people, but they're based on the people that um, Fitzgerald was hanging out with on, on, in, in places like Westview, which become um, the, 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 the various areas in which Gatsby is, is actually set. And one of the key protagonists in, in the real story of eugenics in that era is Mary Harriman, who is the widow of E.H. Harriman, the um, railway tycoon, um, you know, millionaire, not billionaire, because no one was a billionaire back then. Um, but she is, she's a multimillionaire and lives up on West Egg, and she has a daughter called Mary Harriman Rum, um, Rumsey, who knew Fitzgerald. And Fitzgerald went to parties, and Zelda, his wife, went to parties with the, with the Harrimans. And the daughter was so interested in eugenics that her nickname at college was Eugenia. Um, now, again, this is where some of the public, there's the sort of conversations that this, these type of American aristocrats are, are having at their wild parties, some of which are described in, in Gatsby and other literature of the time. But Harriman, Mary Harriman, via meeting Charles Davenport, via her daughter, who knows um, Scott Fitzgerald, becomes the primary funder of the eugenics records office based at Cold Spring Harbor in um, upstate New York, which is the official 
eugenics um, office of the United States from its foundation in 1910 until it's um, um, dismantled in 1939. And Harriman is the primary funder. She donates money every year, something like $39,000 per year for the entirety of that period. Other people also fund it, and they include um, the Carnegie Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, John Rockefeller is, some, some people have argued, is the richest man who's ever existed in America. He, so, something like the GDP of America, something like 3% of the GDP of America um, for the first um, couple of decades of the 20th century was in Rockefeller's pocket. Now, the Rockefeller Foundation is a good foundation today, and its legacy is absolutely um, uh, a, a, a positive benefit of um, uh, its philanthropy is superb. But as was culturally normalized at the time, Rockefeller is also funding the eugenics record office at Cold Spring Harbor and other eugenics records offices around the world. And this, this becomes significant in the way this story develops. These three fellows are, are, are key protagonists in the actual, rather than just the funding, in the actual development of eugenics. Charles Davenport, who is a sort of geneticist, evolutionary biologist, animal breeder, and he's the sort of scientific mind behind this. He meets Galton in 1899, begins to develop ideas about improving the stock of British people, of, of American people after, after that. He also did fundamental and foundational work in um, human genetics, including trying to describe the inheritance patterns of things like eye color in a way that is still taught in schools today, the initial discovering the initial inheritance patterns of diseases like Huntingdon's. And he's very, very focused on what becomes the dominant idea of the scientification of eugenics, which is that one gene is responsible for complex characteristics. And the way we talk about eye color today, which is wrong, and the way we teach eye color genetics today, which is also wrong to school children, comes from Davenport and his absolute commitment to what we might describe as monogenic determinism. His second in command is called Harry Lachlan in the middle. I'll talk about him in just a second. And then there's another guy who's not at the ERO, but is at a sanatorium in New Jersey called Henry Goddard. Now, Henry Goddard's role in this story is really important as well for, for a number of reasons. He is the first person to translate the IQ test from Binet and Simon into American and IQ tests become very important in establishing eugenic principles and eugenic enforcement in, in America. Um, he's also the first person to use the word moron as a pseudo clinical term for eugenic uh, sterilization and enforcement. Just checking the time because I could probably talk about this without breathing for another 24 hours and I'm about halfway through. No, I'm doing all right, right? So Goddard is a big part of, of this story, but I want to focus on one particular aspect of this story, which is that he's working in the first decade of the 20th century with a young girl, an eight-year-old girl called Deborah Kalikak, who he describes as a, a, a moron, an imbecile, and a low-grade idiot. But he's interested in why she is like this. And she, he, he tracks her family tree, but he plots a family tree which goes back six generations to Martin Kalikak, a pseudonymous, um, uh, returning war hero, civil war hero, who on the way back from the war to his Quaker upstanding family and wife, stops off at a, a, at a bar, has sex with what he describes, uh, what is described in, in Goddard's book as an attractive but feeble-minded barmaid, impregnates her and then never speaks to her again. Now, Goddard establishes this family tree, which perfectly bifurcates with the children of the attractive, unnamed, but feeble minded um, barmaid and the family of uh, the upstanding family of of um, of Calicac on, on the on, on his Quaker side. The Quaker side are full of upstanding you know, men of science, men of clergy, businessmen, and they're all very successful. And on the barmaid side, they're full of delinquents and degenerates and people with disabilities and extreme, extreme poverty. And he sees this perfect bifurcation and tracks, using this pedigree, using this family tree, tracks what he establishes, according to this, this uh, analysis, as a single gene responsible for the feeble-mindedness and this in one branch of the family and the success in the other. So again, we've got this model of monogenic determinism, like we see in other Mendelian traits, like we see in eye color or cystic fibrosis, but we see it for a complex range of behaviors, which include these sort of broad pseudo scientific or pseudo psychiatric diagnoses on one side and great success in, in, in you know, whatever metric you choose to employ for success on, on the other side.
This is a bestseller. It becomes hugely influential. We see direct repercussions of this idea in England in 1912 at the first Eugenics International Conference, where Reginald Punnett, who is the guy who invents the Punnett square that we've all used to determine inheritance patterns in, in genetics, um, presents at this conference on the Strand in London in front of Winston Churchill and Arthur Balfour, uh, this idea that feeble-mindedness runs in families in a single monogenic way, and therefore we should act upon it. Therefore we should apply eugenic sterilization to people who have feeble-mindedness in, in, their, in their families. It doesn't happen because that clause is removed from that particular act. Arthur Balfour at that dinner um, sets up the, um, at that conference, sorry, uh, begins the process of setting up the Arthur Balfour Professor of Genetics at Cambridge, which still exists today and is populated by Anne Ferguson Smith, who's a wonderful and brilliant human geneticist. Reginald Punnett is the first in, in that line. Now, the problem with this whole bit of, of the story, if you know anything about genetics, you'll know that there are no psychiatric or behavioral traits which are governed by single genes. And in fact, the traits that we think about as being determined by single genes actually mostly turn out not to be. Uh, anyway, and that includes things like eye colour. But that's not the problem with this. The problem with the Calicat family tree is they never existed, right? Martin Calicat didn't exist. The feeble-minded but attractive barmaid did not exist. He did track, he, we, 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 I, we know the names of the people that were in these, in these two branches of the families, including the degenerate side of the family, but they weren't the Calicats and they weren't the descendants of, of of the feeble-minded but attractive barmaid. They were the descendants of someone who was a business owner and had plenty of successful and literate people within the family. It did also include um, uh, heredity, uh, hereditary, hereditary poverty and various um, uh, medical conditions. But if you look, there's, there's photos in, in this book and some of the photos include pictures of the Calicat children who have facial developmental deformities and when you look at them with any sort of background in medical genetics at all, or any, any sort of clinical understanding of exactly what they look like, you will immediately be able to identify that those children have fetal alcohol syndrome, which of course is not genetic at all in its origin, its etiology. It is a totally socio, uh, socially and culturally mediated thing. So we've got this absolute commitment from the eugenicists to this idea that single genes create heritable problems in families and her heritable successes in, in other families. And therefore this justifies the idea of eugenics because they can be bred in or out of populations. And it's a house of cards. It doesn't exist. The Calicax didn't exist. The genetics is wrong. They are absolutely committed. They're wedded to a scientific idea, which is simply not true. Okay. Now, I said that there was popular support for it, and that is definitely true. It's not universal though, and there were plenty of scientists at the time and plenty of members of society, such as GK Chesterton and HG Wells and other sort of significant cultural players who are aware that there are problems with the sort of the, the, the commitment to this, this science or this pseudoscience. TH Morgan is one of the great founders of, of, um, of, of genetics. And he points out as early as 1925, that this commitment to a monogenic version of complex disorders such as feeble-mindedness or whatever it is in the, in the Calicax, debauchery, um, alcoholism, social misconduct, crime, all of these things which are part of the eugenics um, uh, sort of framing are, are, not, are obviously not, not correct. The, the, the nurture aspect of the development of these problems in families is being um, ignored or, or being suppressed by the uh, eugenics enthusiasts. What the, 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 the line he says at the bottom there may be to a large extent communicated rather than inherited. This, this what, what he means by communicated is, a, is a, an old fashioned term for inherited, uh, but in a non-genetic way, because of course we inherit our environment from our, from our, our family as well as our, our biology. So it's not universally accepted, but, but uh, there are scientists thinking about this uh, in a specific way. Now, that, that, that's America. It, it's, it, sort of, um, it continues to grow and thrive into the 1930s in America. But in the, 19, in the late 1890s, eugenics begins to emerge in, in, in Weimar Republic, Germany, and begins to develop in similar ways with a lot of contact with both um, 
with both uh, the British eugenicists and the American eugenicists. But it, again, it's slightly different. So it's all predicated on, on similar, in a similar sense to the Americans about replacement theory or replacement ideas that Slavs are coming from the, um, from the East and are pushing Nordic or Aryan people away and they're having more babies and so on. And so the development of the idea of Nordic purity becomes central to the, to the German eugenics movement. In a fascinating way, the first eugenicists, and for the first two decades of the 20th century, the keenest enthusiasts for eugenics, particularly a man called Alfred Plurtz, are not anti-Semitic. In fact, they regard Jewish people as being so successful in, in their, their particular domains that Nordic people should breed with Jewish people in order to promote their own um, Nordic success. And it only later on with the rise of Hitler and, and Hitler seizing power in 1933 and his virulent and rampant anti-Semitism, do they begin to adopt anti-Semitism on the grounds that this is the guy and, and Nazism and the Third Reich uh, is the policy, is, is the government which is going to enable eugenics policies more broadly and therefore we can concede anti-Semitism and, and weave that into our eugenics policies. Um, but it wasn't part of it initially. Now, um, again, I'm picking out, I'm cherry picking various you know, moments in time and obviously history is complex and winds all over the place. So, so this, this is a sort of very linear story of a very mess, messy history. But one of the key ideas that develops in 1920 in a particular textbook by Irvin, um, Irvin God, Fritz Lentz, Irvin Bauer, um, is the idea of Lebens unvertes Leben, so the lives unworthy of, of life. And this becomes a central idea in the development of euthanasia and eugenics policies in, in 20s Germany and then into the Third Reich in the 30s. But, and this is super, super important, almost all of their ideas are directly and demonstrably uh, and physically influenced by the enacted eugenics policies that are already happening in, in the States. The Americans are so far ahead of the game in terms of enacting eugenics policies that they recruit American eugenicists uh, in order to develop German eugenics and euthanasia programs in the 1920s um, and 30s. And Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Foundation, funds the Berlin um, uh, eugenics uh, office. And Harry Lachlan, who wrote in 1920 the legislation that to, uh, was an attempt to unify various ad hoc attempts at, at legis eugenics legislation in the states, in multiple states. They used that, directly translating that from US documents, from this, this book by Harry Lachlan, and that becomes the 1933 sterilization laws that Hitler adopts as one of his first, act, first acts in June 1933, having taken power in February 1933. So you've got this incredible link between the American eugenicists, which is dominated by very few but active people, and the development of the German sterilization, eugenics, and euthanasia laws in 1933 uh, and onwards. And we don't know the exact numbers, um, uh, uh, but the, the estimates are that over, over the years 1933 to 39, uh, something like 350,000 people are involuntarily sterilized. And of course, the same pattern occurs that I talked about at the beginning. At first, it's people with very specific med medical diagnoses, and then it just expands and expands and expands until it becomes Jews and Slavs and Roma. And then um, in 1939, uh, so before 39, Hitler has already said that he, he's, he's passionate about um, Spartan infanticide. He cites the Spartans. He cites Madison Grant's book, um, the, the Fall of the Great Race from 1916. American writer is the only, only American writer he cites, apart from Henry Ford, who was another virulent anti-Semite. Um, and um, he, he says in 1938, I think it is, that he doesn't imagine that the German people will accept euthanasia uh, unless uh, it is during wartime. Um, and then there's a, there's a specific incident involving a, 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 a disabled boy called Gerhard Kretschmar, um, who was born severely disabled, and whose parents, rural farmers near Leipzig, um, were members of the Nazi party, and they asked their local doctor, William, uh, not William, uh, Cattle, his name was Cattle, 
um, uh, to to kill the child, to 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 euthanize the child. But the the doctor points out that this is illegal. So they go to Ger they go to Berlin and say to the Führer, um, um, we we wish to kill this child because he's he's degenerate and deformed. And Hitler sends his personal physician, um, uh, Brandt, um, to the Kretschmars to assess the child Gerhardt and finds, and, and Hitler's instruction is that if he finds that the diagnosis is correct, then he should have the baby killed and, and they would test, they would use that to test the legality of it. And that is what happened. So Gerhard Kretschmer was killed in, I think it was July, 1939. And there was no legal challenge, of course, because it was a totalitarian state pretty much by, by that point. And so they design what then subsequently becomes known as the, the law of the, the, the law of racial purification and the Nuremberg laws, um, which get collectively referred to as Axiom T4. Um, and it's backdated to the 1st of September, which is two days after uh, Germany invades Poland and, and uh, war is declared. And so that's the German story. And, and it's during the course of the war, you know, I don't, I don't need to tell you the details of that, but the eugenics is not is, 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 is not what happens during um, uh, during Second World War Germany. And it's not what happens during the murder of six million Jews and millions of others in the concentration camps and, and beyond. But it is a kind of lifeblood to it. The policies of the Nazis were deranged and they drew from many sources, many religious and scientific and pseudo-scientific sources. But it is the, in the dehumanization of people that was central to the eugenics movement, Labens und Werthes Labens, that eugenics is an absolute sort of enabling lifeblood, a, 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 a pump at the center of the heart of, of, of um, Nazi policies. And so one of the ideas in the first half of the book and one of the ideas I'm trying to explore in my work is how you get from an esoteric academic idea by an obscure Victorian gentleman in 1883 um, to the Holocaust. In, in 60 years. And I think it's important to think about these things because it is the normalization of difficult ideas. It is the bastardization of science and the marshalling of science into political ideologies, which I find interesting. And I find that um, geneticists and scientists often don't know their own history. I'd have to discover this history for myself, although being at UCL, it is, it's part of our history. But one thing that I've noticed in the last few years that I've begun teaching this more and more is that we know this stuff at UCL and, 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 and to a lesser extent at other universities in the UK, but this is not widely known beyond, um, beyond the UK and beyond even the biology department of UCL. One of the motivations for the UCL eugenics inquiry was the discovery by departments in the humanities and sociology and philosophy um, that we had this history. And so there was this, you know, very, there were loads of awkward moments when the geneticists were sitting around going, yeah, well, we've been teaching this for 40 years or so, and you're sort of discovering this now. And of course, you know, we shouldn't be indignant about people discovering stuff that we already know. We should be, um, we should lament the fact that we didn't do a better job in sharing that information. Now, I, I do have, I've got a couple more slides. I'm wondering whether, Pat, I should stop so we can go to questions because I've lost track of time. And what do you think? Um. I think you go on for uh, a couple of minutes more, and then and then we should go to questions. But it's a fascinating story, so I think people probably would like to to hear your well. As, as I warned, I I didn't. You know, this is this is a trial run, so just cut me off. Stop. You know, give, w w wave, and, and I will stop because I think there's enough to talk about already, and I haven't really begun to talk about the repercussions in today's world. Um, this is this is just an example of Nazi propaganda to show the ideas of eugenics. So werde es kommen, wenn minderwertige vier Kinder und hochwertige zwei Kinder haben. This is what will happen when low-minded people, feeble-minded people have four children and high-minded people have two children. So again, it's that eternal idea of, of replacement. Upper classes, the educated classes are not having enough children. And... Um, the underclasses are having having too many. Now, second on the right there is Karl Brandt. 
And Karl Brandt is Hitler's personal physician before the war and then becomes his sort of the chief architect of the psych psychiatric, but also broadly medical program of the Third Reich. And he is the person sent to Gerhard Kretschmar in 1939 to assess this, this boy and to um, have him killed, which starts off the euthanasia program in, in Axiom T4 in, in Nazi Germany. After the war and the Nuremberg trials, so the Nuremberg trials start in 45, uh, but the second wave of the trials are called the doctor's trials, and it's the USA versus Karl Brandt at et al. And Brandt is one of, I think, 17 people prosecuted um, and almost all found guilty, and he's hanged. But during the Nuremberg doctor's trials, they do specifically cite the American influence. They specifically cite the use of American legislation in order to develop euthanasia and eugenics policies in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, the reason I talk about him specifically is, is in the book, and I'll do it briefly now, because a question that emerges from this whole discussion, which I think is fascinating and slightly sinister, but one that needs to be asked is, would eugenics work, right? Because we are animals and we are evolved and we are subject to selection pressures over uh, evolutionary time and, and in the modern era. So the question becomes, you know, all of these analogies that the eugenicists all the way back to Plato, in fact, have used, which is that we can be bred. You know, if, if you can breed horses or you can breed roses, um, then you can breed humans and therefore we should do that. And that's an interesting question. And it's a question which I, I get really stuck into in, in the book in various ways, but I want to talk about one specific example with reference to Karl Brandt and the Nazis. One of the diagnoses that was specifically targeted by the, the, the Nazis is schizophrenia. And in the, under Axiom T4, the estimates are that something like between 250 and 300,000 people with schizophrenia, diagnosed schizophrenia in Nazi Germany are uh, permanently sterilized or, or murdered. And we think that that represents something like three quarters to 100% of people with schizophrenia in Germany at that time. So you've removed all the people with a specific diagnosis from the population in a way that, you, that is, is, is part of the eugenics and euthanasia program. And then what we see after the war is that there is a, there is a decrease in the prevalence of schizophrenia for several decades. But by the 1970s, the incidence of schizophrenia has not only returned to pre-war levels, but has actually increased. Now, so there were more schizophrenic people in Germany in the 1970s than there were accounted for in, in the pre-war era. Now, there's many ways to, to, to look at this. There's many ways to try and understand and what has happened here. And we can talk about diagno different diagnostic techniques, whether the diagnoses are more encompassing than they were before the war, but we think, we think that actually it, the opposite is more likely to be true, that the diagnosis has become more precise over time than, than less. There's been discussions of um, changing demographics that um, in the 60s and 70s, there were large uh, immig immigrant populations had moved into Germany but assessment of schizophrenia in the immigrant populations in the Mannheim area, in the one particular study that I'm referring to, shows that schizophrenia incidence is lower in those populations than in um, uh, long-standing German people. Um, and so all of the various attempts to explain this phenomenon, which shows, which appears to show that not only did mm -hmm. eugenics not work for this particular condition, but it actually had the opposite effect. The, I think the most convincing is that the environment, schizophrenia is, is, is very heritable and has a large genetic component to it, um, but it is also heavily in, uh, modulated by, by the in, environment. And I think the most probable answer to the increased incidence of schizophrenia in post-war Germany is that they created the environment which includes a country broken, economically and culturally broken by the war, which is exactly the type of environment in which mental health disorders flourished best. And we, we have, it, it sounds a bit fluffy that, right? It sounds a bit theory, but we actually have one example where the, that answer is absolutely verifiable. And that's in, it's, it's from what's known as the hunger winter, which started in 19, um, 44, September 44, which is in the end game of the war, um, the Nazis blockaded a large area of West, Western Holland. The canals froze. They removed all of the butter, all of the dairy, all of the um, 
animals and enforced a period of famine which started in September and lasted until Operation Chowhound and Operation Manor by the RAF and Allies and by the, the uh, Canadian Air Forces. Um, so you've got this enforced period of, of, um, of, of famine where 18,000 people die and hundreds of thousands of people are, are subject to, to um, starvation. But because this is rationing and because this is the, the modern era, um, we've got really, really good data on what these people were eating, what their calorific intake was during this entire period. And because it's in the modern era, scientists have followed up the people who, were, who lived through the, the hunger winter and who were conceived during the hunger winter and indeed their children as well. And what you see is very predictably, people conceived during the, during the hunger winter suffer from a whole range of developmental and psychiatric problems that, that we now understand are very clearly associated with, with in uterine starvation or, or, or insult. And one of those is schizophrenia, three times the risk uh, of, of developing schizophrenia from the babies born in, in, in the hunger winter. Um, and so we've got this very clear model, a very, very clear example of how their attempts to eradicate a particular disorder um, in the context of a very messy and, and violent war actually had literally the opposite effect. Now, I, I will stop there. Um, I, obviously, I've got a million hours more things to talk about and quite a few more slides if you're interested. I'd quite like to move off that, that slide. Um, but let me, let me, let me oh, see, I've got absolutely tons more, but I'll, I'll stop there and get a blank slide. And we, maybe some of these things that I've, I've, um, I'll come to, I'll talk about in the discussion, in the questions, but thank you for listening. As I said, I haven't timed this. It's the first run out. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. It, it's, uh, a pretty horrifying story that you've told us many things that I'm sure many of the audience didn't know about. Uh, and, and thank you for that. We'll just take a, a few minutes for people to type in some questions and then, then we'll carry on and have a, a bit of a discussion and put some of these questions to you. We normally finish around uh, nine, but uh, it doesn't matter, we run a little bit late. Nobody's got to catch the bus home. Uh, so uh, we'll just take a few minutes um, to let people put in some questions. I'll just put to you some uh, some of the questions uh, that, that uh, we've got. Um, one questioner uh, who starts his question by saying they they'll never look at a cornflake in the same way again. Uh, Asked the question, uh, the list of the US states adopting eugenicist policies is not what one might have expected, and it seems to be dominated by the West and East Coast liberal states and not the ex slave southern states. Is there an obvious reason for that? Um, well, that is a good question, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that. So um, one of the things that the ERO tried to do was to contend the idea that this was very much a top down strategy from from, you know, wealthy, white, um, upper class people to the people. And one of the things they did successfully in the US was to really bring out the comparison with agriculture. And so the first sort of popular there were, there were eugenics fairs, right? So eugenics baby, baby, better baby competitions were, they started in Kansas in 1907, I think it was, and they were part of agricultural fairs. And there's a quote from, from um, one of the key eugenicists at this time saying that while you're judging the Holsteins and the Frisians, we'll be judging the Joneses and the, and the Smiths. And so there was a real attempt to try and get working class and particularly agricultural communities involved in that. So, so that, that, that is happening in the, in the Midwest, particularly it starts in Can Kansas. I, I think maybe part of the answer to this is that, well, I can, I, I am speculating now, I don't really know the answer to this, but one of the things that people forget is that California, the main industry in California is not Hollywood, it's, it's actually farming, 
So they are, it's a huge agricultural population historically in California, which may account for part of California's um, vigorous, enthusiastic adoption of eugenics policies. But here's another suggestion. And again, got to stress, I don't know the answer to that. And it's a very good question is that eugenics policies did disproportionately target poor people. But in America, where poverty is heavily stratified by race and the descendants of the enslaved, uh, black people, descendants of the enslaved, and remember this is only like one or two generations from people who were enslaved, were disproportionately targeted. So it may be that those, those coastal regions, which we associate with being liberal, because they're urban or tend to be, you know, have, have large urban you know, cities and therefore have large black populations. It may be that we see, we, we see those effects in cities more than in the country. But that is a, that is a semi-informed guess. And I don't know, maybe, maybe whoever asked the question has a, has a view on that. Does that sound right? I, well, the, the, it's a webinar, so we can't. Uh, That's true. Uh, the participants themselves can't <laughs> can't come back at you. So um, interesting. Uh, there's a couple of questions that relate to the same issue uh, around how these policies might, in the present time, be implemented in a a kind of undercover way. There's a couple of questions about incarceration being used uh, instead of sterilization in effectively keeping people out of breeding by basically shutting them away. Do, do you think that's a real thing? It, not only is it a real thing, it's a real thing which is enacted in the current era in California and other state, uh, states in, in America. So involuntary sterilization continues to happen in America and um, in other places around the world, but, but I mostly focus in America. It happens almost exclusively in, in uh, prisons or in the immigrant detention centers. Last year, 20 women were have, have, have claimed, I think legitimately, that they were given involuntary hysterectomies. Um, and so, so the association between internment, imprisonment and, and involuntary sterilization is both historically real and, and real in a contemporary way. So wh when I go on to talk about the, the sort of contemporary ramifications, the, the involuntary sterilization continues to exist in, in the States, in, in detention centers. Mm -hmm. Around the rest of the world, I can see one of the questions is what are, what are the ramifications today? And that is what half the book is about. But if you look at, so, so in India, which has had active eugenics policies since the 1970s, um, semi-permanent via IUD or permanent via tubal ligation sterilization of women is the primary form of, of birth control. So 40% of women of, of a child-bearing age have either semi-permanent or permanent sterilization. And that's, that is encouraged and sometimes coerced and sometimes incentivized by, by the state. In China, where um, sex selective abortion is, is endemic and where f until, you know, from the seventies until 2015, it was the one child policy existed and then it was two children. And then last year it became three children in 2000. Uh, I want to say 15, but it might've been 12 in either 2015 or 2012, 12, it was, there was the iron fist policy which was the involuntary sterilization of 10,000 women who had violated the one child policy. And that happened over the space of three months. So, you know, this, is, this, this stuff is, is real and contemporary. It happens less in, in, in the West, but still definitely does happen. There's a class action of, a, of hundreds of uh, First Nation women in Canada against involuntary sterilization that they endured in the, within the last you know, 10 years. So it's very real and very really exists today. Uh, there's also a question about gene manipulation therapy, gene editing, and whether you would consider that as a kind of eugenics and perhaps a, an acceptable one or not. 
Right. Well, my other 30 slides are about that <laughs> and I won't, I won't do the rest of it. But I think that there's many things to say about that. And I think that the first thing is, I, I'm not sure the semantics are important, right? The, the book is called Control because all of these ideas are about eliciting control over, over unruly biology. And you're a biologist and you know how difficult it is to control anything to do with reproduction. Um, um, now, what, what the, 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 the eugenics laboratories that disband in the 1930s and after the war become genetics laboratories. They become human genetics labs. And that happens at UCL, it happens at Uppsala, it happens all over Germany and all over America. Cold Spring Harbor was voted the, the best um, research station on earth in 2018 by, by nature. And it and was the hub of this, the human genome project. Um, my department's genes, evolution and environments was the Galton Laboratory um, uh, 20 years ago and, and was the eugenics office 100 years ago. So you see this move from the study of heredity in with, with eugenics as its ideological framework to the study of human genetics in, in the 1960s and 1970s. And I think there is a fundamental distinction because they are scientific um, labs and establishments whereas the eugenicists were primarily ideological labs that have coerced science or co-opted science into, into their framework. And you see the development of reproductive technologies and genetic techniques, which are primarily in service of alleviating suffering in individuals and giving choices to parents. So you see the development of IVF and you see the development of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, primarily by scientists or exclusively women by chance in the Galton laboratory in the 1980s um, and and now in the in the modern age we begin to see the ability to gene edit um, uh, especially with new techniques like CRISPR and in fact you know the the heinous case of the of Hei Jiang Kui in the last couple of years who did who did gene edit two babies who were born though unsuccessfully, the gene editing was done unsccessfully, but they were born illegally and, and immorally. Um, but we're at a stage where, where the techniques, I don't think they are eugenics, because I don't think they're state imposed, and I don't think they're imposed for a population level. Um, but I think they are techniques which would have, be, would have been in, of interest if they had existed to the eugenicists 100 years ago because our ability to control reproduc reproduction has only improved and become more precise. I still think it's incredibly unruly and, and incredibly difficult to do. But I had a slide of, with Dominic Cummings on, on it because he's someone who's obsessed with the, this, the, these ideas um, uh, and has taken more than a passing interest in current in contemporary techniques in, for example, polygenic scoring for, for complex traits such as intelligence and has suggested that this, this is what's coming, that we could improve, we could potentially improve the intelligence of, of babies via embryo selection, via polygenic scoring, as a result of the IVF process. And, you know, that's he's he whispered in the ear of the Prime Minister of one of the, um, the, 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 the biggest and most successful countries historically, on earth, so so it's it is part of the of the of the public conversation. There's a couple of questions asking about, uh, you know, eugenics. Its history seems to be at least the history that we know about, in connection with white people wanting to stop non-white people uh, breeding. Is that really its history, or in other parts of the world, China, for example? Uh, was the same thing going on or in the past there? Did people have these same ideas? It's a brilliant question. And I, what I would expect from this, this audience, um, <laughs> the development of eugenics as a pseudoscientific ideology does come inherently with white supremacy associated with it. So it is primarily developed by white Americans, white British people and, and white Germans. Um, um, 
the, the longer standing idea of population control via, via control of reproduction is, I, th I argue, universal and has occurred in all populations and all cultures for all, all time. But eugenics specifically, I think, develops out of white supremacy because it's because we're, we, we're, we're talking about a time where colonial expansion is is a, an effect of white supremacy. Right. You've got Cecil Rhodes, you've got Winston Churchill, you've got Francis Galton and thousands of others, men, men of of, um, of high society and power who do genuinely think that's that's white people should not just are, are the best people on earth but should replace people in the in in other countries because anglo-saxons are are of the greatest quality churchill's very explicit about that you know he says that virtually verbatim cecil road it is part of cecil Rhodes' um um uh, uh, doctrine all all through his life so i think it begins as associated with with eugenics itself begins associated with white supremacy but I've just mentioned China and I've just mentioned India as well. And so you can't apply those those same criteria to that. There's a absolutely fascinating and bizarre, frankly, um, sort of cul-de-sac within the American eugenics story, which is that in the 1910s and 20s, um, there is a movement amongst uh, emancipation of black people and the sort of scholarly class of black people led by W.E.B. Du Bois, the great black American scholar, who is very, she, he's, he's, he's mates with Margaret Sanger, who's the sort of first wave feminist and the sort of in, in, um, the, the um, pioneer of birth control. And um, what's it called? What's the, what's the main um, birth control organization in the States called? Um, of uh, uh, Planned Parenthood. So she is a creator of Planned Parenthood um, and one of those first wave suffragists. Um, her um, association with W.E.B. Du Bois, um, he writes for her magazine that black uplift, which is this concept of how to make black people more successful, should include eugenics type policies. It should include encourage the breeding of the, the best quality of, of African-Americans and not the, 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 the lowest classes. Now he does, you know, it's, it's not a major part of his work, but it's definitely there. And it's, and I, and I include it as a small section in the book. I don't think it's that many people have written, many scholars of, of, um, of America, uh, American history and black history in America have talked about this in much greater detail, but mm -hmm. Racial uplift using eugenics policies is part of W.E.D. Du Bois's um, uh, intellectual output. Mm. Uh, while on that, that kind of theme, I, I went at the beginning of your talk, this is a question of mine, you showed these titans of uh, the development of, you know, evolutionary theory and genetics and so on. And yet they knew about ideas of hybrid vigor and uh, you know, advantages of heterozygosity and, and so on. So, of, of, you know, interbreeding. Uh, how did they manage to keep that disconnect in their minds and have this idea that it was better to breed like with like? Well, I mean, I, I, <laughs> it's, again, amazing question. And between you and me, and I hope the other 130 people aren't listening, my real interest in this stemmed from studying the modern synthesis. And so trying to understand the process by which natural selection becomes population genetics and incorporates genetics into it is really what I'm sort of fascinated in most of all. I'd like to write a biography of Fisher and Haldane, but no one would publish that and fewer people would read it. Um, <laughs> but fundamentally, you've got the... One of the things that I think is really interesting is whether you can separate the scientific work of Pearson and Fisher from their political beliefs. And that plays into the whole conversation about how we treat them today, whether we should remove their statues or names from our, our universities or from our stat, you know, our plinths. And I think that, well, the first thing is, I think you have to look at them individually. I don't think there is, there is, you know, I don't think you can apply broad brushes or, or generalize for it, all of the individuals. And, you know, Imperial last week um, have uh, proposed removing uh, Thomas Huxley from their, their campus. And I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right in the same way that removing Pearson absolutely was. 
And I'm slightly equivocal about Fisher. I think Fisher was a bad guy, um, but I think more than anything, he was just sort of deeply insensitive and data driven. But he definitely was ideological and ideologically committed to eugenics. He founds the Cambridge Eugenics Society as an undergraduate. His first, you would love this, his first writings are in the in the eugenics um, in-house magazine for the Galton Institute, what becomes the Galton Institute. And they're, they're essays about, that, that touch on, you, you can see the development of things like Fisherian runaway selection in these early, in these, these, these essays he's writing when he's like 21. Um, but they definitely also include applying these sorts of models of of, um, of selection to, to humans. He talks about ruddy cheeks and stinky breath as being potential runaway selective, you know, exaggerated traits for human mating. And so you've got these, it, it's, it's so fascinating because it, on the one hand, you can see the emergence of some of the really the genuinely smartest ideas anyone's ever had. Mm. You know the, the 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 modern synthesis is emerging in his thoughts, and at the same time, his absolute commitment to um, the enemy at the gates, the fall of Rome, the great civilizations, um, the, the the poor people having too many babies, incentiv tax incentivizations for for uh, middle middle and upper class people to have more babies, and that is in that's in his text that's in his textbook, the genetical theory of natural selection, which is. You know that, that that's the origin of species for population genetics, and, it, and I'd, I'd never noticed it before. I, and it's right there. It's right there. And then Haldane comes along, and Haldane's he he's eaten Oxford, and then takes a radically different view. He becomes a, a he's a socialist, and then he becomes a communist, and then he becomes a Stalinist. So equally problematic in terms of his political legacy. He becomes and he re, he remains a Stalinist and, until well after the Second World War. But his view on eugenics is like the polar opposite of, of, of Fisher's. Mm -hmm. and, and his book, Politics and Her Heredity and Politics, which is not in this room right now, is uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a popular science book, but it's, it, it melds politics with the science and it does the opposite of what those the, the Cold Spring Harbor guys was trying to do, which is he looks very carefully at family trees um, and how things like haemophilia are passed through royal families the victorious families and descendants and he comes to the opposite conclusion he just says you know these things aren't monogenic they're heavily influenced by the environments and and that for did i did i did i include the slide i did i think i didn't get to the slide hold on a minute let me just quickly without going back to let me um because he says this thing oh, I, I when i do this talk better next time i will um I will make sure I get to this one, which is that this is what he says. Can you see that? Uh, yes. <laughs> so he says that in 1938. And, and I, my, I think that is true today. So when you get people like Dominic Cummings saying things like that last year, oh. I think that what Haldane said in 1938 is still true. It's true, and, and, and of course, IQ is a controversial subject, and then when you think of Cyril Burt and his fabrication of data on the inheritance of IQ, and you touched a bit on that kind of thing, we can't even rely on the veracity of the data uh, that are put forward. Um, we could go on, for ages more with this, there, there are a number of other questions, uh, questions along the lines of, you know, does our increased understanding of inheritance make eugenics uh, not worth doing anymore because we can fix things more or we know that they're not, uh, not worth doing really and so on. But I, I don't think we've got time uh, to go there. Uh, I can briefly answer that because I think the answer is no. I think I think our uh, the more we, you know, the eye color thing that I alluded to, which we do teach to fifteen year olds about how, you know, you know, the allele for blue eyes is recessive and the allele for brown is dominant and blah blah blah. And you all know that we we draw it out on a Punnett square table that was worked out by Charles Davenport, two of the key eugenicists. But it's just not true. It's just it's vaguely true in a prob probabilistic way. 
But what we now know, and this is current work, right? This is work published last year. So this year, this year, 2021. But we know that some, I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but, but something like two thirds of people who have the, the genotype for blue eyes, two copies of, don't have blue eyes. My, my, I, if, if you do your 23andMe, which I'm deeply skeptical of and deeply cynical about, about its role as in understanding ancestry, but my version of the gene uh, OCA2, OCA2, which is the blue brown one, is, is, um, it, it indicates that I have a, a 31% chance of having brown eyes. And I've got two copies of the brown version, the so called brown version. Now, I knew that because, you know, I've got mirrors and I've got brown eyes, but it's a one in three chance that the genetic version of those of that gene, which is the one that we teach to children, is gives you brown eyes if you've got if you're heterozygous or homozygous for for this allele, will give you brown eyes, and it's it's a one in three chance according to according to the largest studies. So the, in answer to the question, does our increased knowledge of, of genetics? Which, which is you know really burgeoning it's great we're going through a golden era of understanding the, the genome um i think it's gone the other way i think we know less about we're less confident in the in the potential eugenic interventions i i if you wanted to have blue-eyed children and you could accurately genotype a fertilized embryo as part of the ivf process and you could identify the exact versions of that gene oca2 to get and you selected an embryo based on the 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 two gene the two versions of the gene that you'd had in that embryo and re-implanted it and that baby went to term and if you went through that whole expensive horrible process you'd have a one in three chance of predicting of, of accurately predicting the, the color eyes that that baby had and that's eye color if you want to do that for iq where in the latest studies 1500 genes have been identified that account for five percent of the variance seen in the heritability of iq i mean it's a, it's a, it's it's like a, it's like it's madness that we're even having this conversation <laughs> well i think on that uh... On that happy note, we, we probably ought to consider ourselves having uh, run out of time. It, it, it was a fascinating talk, Adam, and, and uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to your book. I'm sorry, I apologize to the people who put in comments and questions. We just didn't have, have the time to do justice to them all. Uh, but it was a great talk. It's uh, an amazing uh topic. Uh, people are still putting in wonderful talk and, and thank you for it. And it's given us a lot uh, to think about. Uh, so as George said to you at the beginning, the end of these uh, uh, things is rather abrupt, but uh, I'd just like to thank you really ever so much, Adam, for a, a great topic. And the next time you want to make us a guinea pig for a talk, just uh, Get in touch, <laughs> um, and we'll be listening. And I hope everybody enjoys their conflicts tomorrow. And thanks for <laughs> Kellogg, and uh, so but don't put sugar that. on them. Don't put sugar on them. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. So well, thank you, Pat. Thanks, and thank you for everyone for those those great questions. And sorry I waffled on for so long. No, no, no. It was great. Thank you.